Hi, good afternoon. <coughs> right, Sarah, conversation between us with occasional interjections from, from, right. from the floor. Difficult questions are allowed, so put your hand up yes. if you think of something. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to ask the first question. Go for it. All right, so uh, why did you choose the bar, and in particular, why did you choose your relevant area of practice? Okay, um, I'm probably not the best example of choosing the bar because I didn't actually come here by a direct route. But in some ways that's quite a good example because it means that you don't have to have planned it since you were 10 years old. Um, you can have arrived at this at any stage in your life because the bar reflects society, it's, it's law for everybody. And that's exactly what we're looking for. So wherever you've come from in life, you bring something unique to the bar. I would say that's from my experience. Why did I choose the bar? I was looking for something, I was an employee straight out of university uh, and I realised that I was going to be much better as a self-employed person um, and I just loved the idea of um, advocating my own opinion, um, persuading someone of a viewpoint uh, and representing someone um, to the best of my abilities and the bar offers all of those things. You, you might see a different aspect of the bar for you that you, you are attracted to. It's one of those odd jobs where it has such a range of essential skills. It's not just about getting the right answer on the law. You sometimes have to calm down your client because they're extremely stressed about a big financial impact. You have to persuade them that you are right, that you, they can trust you. That's a soft skill that you're not going to be able to learn by books. It's something else. So don't think the bar is simply about analysing the law. It's going to be so much more than that. So you might choose the bar for a completely different set of reasons from the reasons that I chose the bar. But that's why I chose the bar, because of the fact that I could do my advocacy and I could um, allow my opinions to come through and I can represent clients. Uh, and that's exactly what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. What about you, Cheryl? Ah, well, I see your employment and I raise it. <laughs> <clears throat> I had an even more circuitous route to the bar. <clears throat> do not be fooled by the accent. Uh, this is actually... Uh, a Kenyan accent with a few uh, twiddles uh, because I actually grew up in Kenya. Um, I lived there till I was 19. I then did a secretarial course and uh, I became a secretary. I was a very poor employee. Um, and so rather than get a career, I, I then ended up marrying my boss's friend who was 20 years older uh, and promptly set off for the Far East as, a, as what I like to call a professional corporate wife. Uh, so basically, I was at home, I had kids, uh, I did dinner parties, I learned Japanese, because I was in Japan, it was great. Um, and then uh, that all came to an end, came back to, the, came to this country, and for the first time, I found myself living here. I'd pop backwards and forwards here, my parents are British uh, by origin, uh, but I found myself living here, and it was a real culture shock. So... Uh, did two things. I'm giving the short version, by the way. If any of you want the long <laughs> version, you can buy me a drink at a bar sometime. Um, so, um, never crossed my mind that I would do law. Never even on my horizon. Two children uh, bought a small business in the Lake District. Don't ask. I, I wouldn't advise it. Um, I'm from the Lake District, actually. It's weirdly. beautiful. Where are you? <laughs> Keswick. <laughs> ah, well, I was in Crosthwaite, near Kendall. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Lovely. Lovely. Gorgeous place. <laughs> Lovely. Do visit it. Don't stay long. Um, I loved have a fight it. Later. But, <laughs> no, no, it's gorgeous. But I notice you're not living there. Well, virtual world now. Virtual world, mm. this is true. But um, that went, that didn't work out very well. And um, I then trained as a hypnotherapist. Uh, which is very interesting, but I wasn't a very good hypnotherapist either. In fact, I was almost too good a hypnotherapist. I used to trigger all, things, all sorts of things off in my client, probably because I'm a type A person, and you really need to be type B and very laid back and relaxed and slow. So I decided I needed to go to university because I'd never got a degree. So I went to Lancaster. In fact, I cut, cut the long... So I went to Lancaster with the intention of doing something called... Um, independent studies. Again, law not on the horizon, apart from occasionally watching um, LA Law, I think it was, I used to watch. Oh, that's nice. Um, and I start, I had to go back and do A-levels, because I didn't have A-levels. So I did A-levels, and one of the A-levels I did was business studies. And it was taught by a solicitor, who taught it according to the law. And um, oh, this was very interesting. So I went, went to Lancaster, and I said, well, there's my second as my second string, so to speak, I'll do law. 
loved it. First two weeks, thought, international studies is not for me. Uh, not international, um, uh, independent studies, not for me. This, this, is, this law thing is awesome. So I walked into the tutor and I meant to say to him, uh, can I cross over to do law? And what I actually said to him was, I want to read law and I want to be a barrister. To this day, I have no idea where it came from, but it felt right. And so I did it. It wasn't particularly easy. It's never easy. I was, uh, I had children. I was in my 30s. I had no history at all. Um, and the reason I've been so expansive about this, and I do apologize for taking up so much of your time, uh, is this. I think if I can do it, even though this was 25 years ago, I had different problems to the ones you have now because um, I was, with all due respect, and we will talk about this later, I think I was a woman, I had a very unusual background. And um, I'm still not quite sure how I did it, but I think I did it with determination and because I really focused. That's why I wanted to be a barrister. I noticed the second half was relevant area of law. Well, mm. that chose me as well. Um, I've ended up doing insolvency property um, and commercial work, basically. Um, and uh, <clears throat> somebody tried very hard to push me into family work, which I just, again, wasn't very good at, whereas what I'm doing now I'm very comfortable with. So that's the, the short version. I think the short answer is it's for everybody, yes, but exactly. you've got to be determined enough to ensure that you find the right place for you. Yes. Those sets up there were yeah. one of them. You know, we're yeah. all wanting to find the right candidates, but you have to find the right set. Mm -hmm. It's a two-way process. So don't just think of it as you being interviewed. You're also an interviewer. Um, so make sure you pick somewhere that you feels right for you. OK, I didn't talk about my relevant area <laughs> of law, but effectively I'm, I do construction commercial. Um, sounds like you need to be an engineer or an architect, right? No, you don't. You don't need to know anything about bridges, tunnels, buildings. You just need to be engaged, interested, and know you're contracting your tort law. And then you get to argue about a nuclear power station or a tunnel or something, and you have an expert sitting by your side telling you what the funky bit of problem is about the, the aspect. And then you cross-examine the world-leading expert on tall, wobbly buildings or whatever it might be. And then you bin all that and go to the next case because the next case is about something completely different. So that, we're a specialist area apparently, but I've never had two cases the same. So, you know, there are all sorts of lives up there available to you. Each set offers you something different. So take the time to investigate because it's your life and you have to be happy with it. What she said. <laughs> yeah. Okay, next question. Mm -hmm. um, did anything make you think twice about choosing the bar? I mean, you've covered some of that already, mm -hmm. I guess, but yeah, anything in particular? Once I had that moment of revelation. No, um, I, I didn't ever think twice about choosing the bar. Well, not, not occasionally since then, I suppose, when I've had a really difficult day and lost at court and you sit there and think, why am I putting myself through this? Mm. That kind of thing. But no, never. It's absolutely the right thing for me. I, I feel that um, it's 25 years this year since I was called. And um, Congrats. Thank you very much. Mm. And I just feel uh, it's absolutely right for me. Um, I've found somewhere that I fit, even though on the surface, you know, from the outside, you wouldn't think I would. But it's great. And I think if it's right for you, you get in and it fits. Lots of nodding heads, that's good. Lots of nodding, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> um, what about you? Um, money, actually. Um, I... I didn't come from an entirely impoverished background, but you know, mm -hmm. I'd had the first degree that I'd paid for, um, and looking at enormous debt, or you know, at that time you're thinking, I need to get a job. Um, and you know, then I had to do the conversion because I didn't do law as my first mm -hmm. degree. And suddenly you're looking at extraordinary sums of debt before you even start earning anything. And then you've got the enormous mountain of pupillage. I'm sure that there are probably you've got some of you might have the same sort of so money was for me the, the concern, and I did actually look at the solicitory because, of course, they pay for your GDL, whatever it's called now, and the BPTC. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm really glad that I didn't do that because I know myself now, and I know that I would not have fitted in into a firm, into that sort of structure. 
and I'm really glad I persevered. And the one thing I would say to you is there is financial help out there. Uh, so investigate today. Do yourself a favour. If, if money is going to be an issue for you, look at the scholarships, the awards that you can get at the inns. There is lots of money help, to help you um, get to where you need to be. I remember the day a cheque arrived through the post from my scholarship, and it was the day that I changed from being solicitor route to the bar. I, and I thank you, Gray's Inn. Thank you very much for changing my, the course of history for me. Um, and it, they can do it for you too if money's an issue. I also think that you know there are sort of fear stories going around about oh, it's really, really competitive. Yes, I mean it is competitive, but it's because it's a really good career. And someone has to get the job, so why shouldn't it be you as opposed to the other person? Mm. If you rule yourself out today, then the other person's going to get it. So don't do that. Go, you know, be realistic about your options. Get the best academic qualifications you can. Don't let anyone stand in the way between you and the best academic grade mm -hmm. you can get. That is mm -hmm. so centrally important. And persevere. And if at the end of the day you don't make it for whatever reason, it might be that you think, actually, it's not for me, or it's just that you don't have success this year or next year or whatever, at least you can be honest with yourself and say, I gave that a really good go. But in 10 years' time, if you told yourself you can't do it today, for me, that's, you've let yourself down because you haven't given yourself the opportunity. So I, I just think it's a great, I really, really important, do in, investigate it. The fact that you're sitting in this room mm -hmm. and you're interested, I think you, you, you know, you're part of the way there already because mm -hmm. you know about the career. It's a great career to do. It really, really is. I'm thrilled every day. I, I never get mm -hmm. bored at work. I know that's I'm true. probably a weirdo. Um, but, you, you know, it's not like you, when you finish your work, you get up and leave. You don't have to stay till five o'clock or seven o'clock because you're not employed by anyone. Sometimes you have to stay later because the deadline is there. But you're driven by your own needs and your own timetables and your own deadlines. That's what makes it mm -hmm. so cool. OK, so I think I went completely off piece there. Marvellous. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I like this question. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a definite perception of the demographics at the bar. Um, so the suggestions here are white male or Oxbridge. Is this true in your experience? And what would you say to someone that is put off by this impression? Um, I can honestly say that when I first came to the bar, that probably was true. Um, where I did my second six pupillage, uh, there was one other woman uh, who also happened to be, I have to say, the only person of an ethnic minority. And uh, I think practically all, th all of the blokes there were um, <clears throat> Oxbridge graduates, most of them with cricketing blues. <laughs> they used to practice chucking cricket balls down the, uh, down the passageway. And I was forced to do a cricket match. Yes. Um, <laughs> so yes, I think that was very true 25 years ago. Um, I don't think it's so true now. And of course, anybody with that background is, still, is very welcome still to apply to us. You know, this is not a question, opening it up is not a question of excluding people because historically they've had advantages. But I do think it's changed enormously in those years, largely because of, um, I think, people like you and I coming into it. Yep. You, you change it simply by being there. You don't even have to do anything particularly uh, dramatic. Um, coming and doing things like this. Um, I think that there, it, there's a lot more openness um, and uh, has been for quite a lot longer than you might think. I mean, if you look at the demographics, I know for Keating, um, but also for us, if you look at our recent tenants, and when I say recent, I mean in the last 10 years, not in the last five minutes, um, you will see a, a wide diversity on all sorts of different levels. Um, people from, uh, who've been to state schools, um, people from, um, who have uh, different you like national backgrounds, people who, who have um, first time at university, uh, first, first generation at university, people who have overcome diversity, uh, people with disabilities. Mm. Um, and if you look, I think at most chambers now, you start to see, you, you see that coming in. Um, so I, I don't think there is, I think the perception that it's like that is doing more damage than it actually being like that, if that, makes, if that makes sense. In other words, people who aren't in that demographic come and go, oh, I'm not in that demographic, and two things happen. They come to a pupillage interview and they're really tense, and they have the view that they shouldn't be there. Mm. And that, of course, then contrasts with somebody who comes in who is relaxed. Because if you're relaxed, your, your pupillage 
interview people get relaxed as well. I mean, we get nervous if you're nervous. Um, or you get the alternative thing, which has happened, and is equally as bad, that someone comes in really aggressive. I deserve to be here. Yeah, you do. Can, can we just talk about why that is? Can we just unpack that? <laughs> um, and it gets a little bit... So the, the thing is to start on the basis that you have as much right, and you, and you do, you honestly do have as much right to come in and seek to be in this profession as anybody from anywhere else. And that's your starting point. You have to add to that. You have to add the, the skills. You have to add the intellectual achievements. And, and that is an absolute, whatever your background, you have to have that intellectual capacity to do this job because it's very challenging. And you have to add whatever other skills, which unfortunately uh, chambers look for, and they do vary from chambers to chambers because people are looking for different things. But you add those skills, you add your people skills, you add your commitment, um, you add whatever other, other abilities you have to create the package that walks in and says, you need me. Because whilst it may be a little bit of a buyer's market, we still want people who are really good and we'll fight for you. So, um, as I say, I think, I think the perception um, is doing more damage than, than the actual attitude in, in, in Chambers. Yeah, happily, I, I absolutely yeah. agree with that. I think it is a different place from, uh, certainly having spoken to my older mm -hmm. colleagues in Chambers who joined, we had the first female construction QC at the bar, Rosemary mm -hmm. Jackson, mm -hmm. awesome lady. Yay. Um, but she said that she was the only woman in town, effectively, in, in, at that time. Uh, and she was dealt with very differently. Uh, mm -hmm. Not because people knew that they were doing it, but just because she was different, so she was treated differently. Now it's not like that. Happily, I'm pleased to... We're not, we may not be perfect, mm -hmm. but we... Um, uh, so, for example, um, I'm a woman. Uh, I went to a state school, and I'm the first person in my family to go to university. So, but I don't regard myself as particularly unusual or, you know, there are loads and loads of heaps of people like that. But they are things that actually are underrepresented, sadly, mm. uh, in our applicants. And I wonder if people are pre-filtering themselves mm. before they come yes. in. We want you to apply. We want to meet you because we want to have the bar representing the people that we serve. Mm. Um, so my clients are construction you know, enormous construction companies building things for the people of the world. Why shouldn't the bar represent that group? It should. Uh, and I think we get better results, better law, better decisions if our judiciary and our bar represents that. So don't pre-filter yourself by thinking, oh, I'm not that right kind of person. Mm -hmm. And also don't be put off by pictures of faces on, on the... Because mm -hmm. on the, on the, you think, oh, well, I'm not there. Well, so. photos only show part of the mm -hmm. issue. You know, there are all sorts of diversity things a, a photo doesn't show. And I would say as well that the generational thing, if you yes. look at the older people in a set, they're going to be less diverse. Look at the last 10 years yeah. and then judge us. Um, Keating got nominated for an e and equality and diversity at the, at the Chambers and Partners this year. We didn't win it because bridging the bar won it quite rightly. But we are trying very hard to make sure that everybody who deserves to be in the set gets there. And it's based on how you persuade us about your legal analysis and your ability to persuade the client, the judge, everyone that you're right. It's not about your background at yeah. all. Absolutely. Okay? You've got to be so, in it to win it. Yeah. Um, and don't be held back. I got pupillage I, I, in the days when you got first and second six pupillage. I, I, I got pupillage at sets that, if I'd really thought about it, I probably wouldn't have aspired to um, because they, I, I, I knew I needed... Um, paid pupillage. Mm. I couldn't have done unpaid. I had two kids and I was divorced at the time, so it was, it was sort of <laughs> a little bit critical to have some money coming through. And so I knew I had to. I, I would not have been able to do it if I hadn't got it. And I applied to <coughs> top chambers, even though I sat there, and, you know, thinking about it logically. Um, I didn't have a background that was particularly going to appeal to them. And I did, I, I got two very good pupillages, and I'm, I'm deeply grateful to, to both sets I went to. I was, particularly in the second one, um, as I say, there was only one other woman in, in the place. But um, I got them because I went in and I demonstrated that I had um, something they were looking for. Mm. Uh, sometimes still a little bit of a mystery to me, but, well. but there we go, I'm here. <laughs> um, so apply you know, don't don't just sit there and think i've got to apply to you know sort of sets that perhaps don't have much of a profile 
apply to the Keating Chambers, apply to the three PBs, because we, we were nominated for Chambers of the Year this oh, year. Oh, congrats. See? That's so, good. Yeah, that's didn't good make one. it. Yeah. Um, uh, I think Matrix got it, actually, and, and jolly good luck to them, but yeah, we'll, get, we'll get it next year. Yeah. Um, That's right. But, but the point is that you can apply to the very good chambers. And um, if you don't get into the very good chambers and you get into one that doesn't have such a high profile, you can work to give it that high profile. You know, it, it's, it's um, so you've got to be in it to win it, and, and you've got to be brave. This is not a profession for people... Um, who, who can't be brave for themselves. Yes. Can I just pick up on that? Mm. You're going to get knockbacks. Yes. It happens to everybody. Don't be put off by the knockbacks. Have a realistic assessment of your abilities and where you're going to get to. But if you get put off by someone telling you, no, you're not getting this mini pupillage, or no, you're not, having this pu you're not getting the pupillage this year, be more resilient than that because that's what the job is as well. Because when you're sitting there in the courtroom having lost and advising <laughs> your client that actually it's going to cost it, because that does happen. Yeah. There are days like that. You need to have the inner strength and resilience to mm. get through it too. It's part of the skill set, that weird blend mm. of things that you bring to the Certainly. bar. Um, we didn't touch on Oxbridge, actually. Yeah. Um, I went to Cambridge. Um, I'm proud I went to Cambridge. But I would say it's neither necessary nor sufficient mm. to get your pupillage. It's just mm. part of your background, mm. um, training. Your, and, I mean, look. It's a great university, but there are loads of great universities. I'm on the pupillage committee at Keating. We send away and don't offer pupillages to hundreds mm. and hundreds of Oxbridge candidates. And we let in and offer pupillage to lots and lots of non-Oxbridge. So again, neither necessary mm. nor sufficient. Don't let that put you off. And don't demonize Oxbridge either, because mm. it doesn't help anybody. Oxbridge candidates are very welcome to apply to. It's just, we're here for everybody, basically. Again, back to... Mm who you are and persuading us, etc. On money, I forgot to mention, but many sets do pay money to your pupillage year that you can pull down. So, so do check that if the money thing is a situation. It's not just about scholarships. We also do pay for pupillages. So I think we're, we're at 70,000 this mm. year and 3PP bills will be 40. similar. Yeah, we're so, at 40. Yeah, yeah. so, so you, there's money available to you which will assist a lot. Mm. So there you go. Don't... D it's, a, it's, it's not something that you should, should put you off at this stage. Okay. Um, did anyone have any questions? Or is it just basically, do you want us to, us to just keep talking? Keep talking. You have, yes, yes, marvellous. You and then you first. Go, go, go. Um, just wanted to add the question on to the Oxford, your yeah. idea of the university. I am a student at the University of Greenwich. Okay. And I'm seriously considering becoming a barrister. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, at Keating, we don't even see which university yeah. you went to. We blind ourselves to gender, school, university. university. We're interested in the yeah. grade you got. Yeah. So if you get a 2-2, then because we get so many applicants, we cut the line there, unless there's something exceptional about the rest of your application. But this is what I say. Don't let anyone come between mm. you and the best possible grade that you can get. First or 2-1, basically. That's what you want. And then go from there to do all the other embellishments mm. like mini pupillages, mooting and all that. But we don't see, we've mm. taken all of that out of our form so we don't unconsciously mm. filter people out who are really, really good. We, we do the same thing. We, we're a gateway set, um, but we can download the gate. So we download from the gateway and we cut out the name, mm. the school, the university. We don't look at A-levels because we think they're inherently discriminatory. Um, we're only interested in your, your law degree. Um, and the, what I would, all I would say to you is, uh, would we look at you from University of, of Greenwich? Are you any good? Can you do the job? Yes or no? Those the answer is the yes. The, uh, we want to hear from you. If the answer is yeah, no, don't exactly, bother. Exactly. It's as simple as that. Did she answer your question? I think she did, <laughs> didn't she? <laughs> <laughs> and we had another question over here. reapply for a mini pupillage that you do. Yeah, I think you can, yeah. I mean, we always say on our mini pupillages that mm. the reason why we knock back people is just we haven't got enough people on the ground to yeah. do them. Sounds awesome. uh, you know, we're, we're doing our day jobs and also mm. desperately trying to give a quality mini pupillage. We're doing virtual mm. at the moment because, of course, yeah. for reasons that everybody knows. We will hopefully go back to in-person 
next year because they are better. I mean, we're trying to make it as personal as yeah. possible on the virtual. But I think you can reapply. The thing, that, the one that we can't reapply for is pupillage unless mm -hmm. there's been a significant change that you can justify that actually you think you have the, the chance to, to demonstrate the skills mm -hmm. we're looking for. Mm -hmm. That's the difference, but mini's no problem. Yeah. Which is where we, in fact, differ from Keating, if I can just say, because we are quite comfortable with people reapplying for pupillage if, if they okay. fail the first year. And, and the reason for that, I think, is probably um, because we're so much broader than you. You're very, um, you, you're very focused in what you do at yes, Cake yes. Teaching. Um, I mean, we're very broad at 3PB. We do so much from, um, uh, from criminal through... Uh, to um, intellectual property, um, that uh, we get enormous numbers of applications. And although we like to think our, our system's really good, we also know that we probably miss people. Mm. You know, maybe they just had a little bit of an off day. So you can always reapply to us. Although once somebody's applied to us about three times and not made it, we do tend to discourage it after that. Mm. But yeah. um, up to then. Yes, there's a question there. Um, we've debated this at length. Um, we do have them in the form. Um, mm. GCSEs we're not interested in, um, but everything else about the uh, the background, so mm. gender, school names, everything like that is gone. And quite frankly, we're more interested in your university yeah. degree um, and also any other bits and pieces you do afterwards. Mm. We have also debated at great length whether to look at postgraduate uh, degrees and so on, because of course that might in itself be discriminatory. Um, so what we've, we've come to the view that we shouldn't discriminate against people who've done the second, the BCL, et cetera, et cetera, but that it, mm. it doesn't yeah. give you an extra point against someone who's done the first degree, because of course you might not have had the money to do a mm. master's or something like that. So it's all part of the mix. That's how our, our current rating yeah. is. It's we very difficult thing. to get it perfect. And I, I confess, I don't know how we're gonna get it perfect, but we are working on it every single year. Yeah. You mentioned the floor of the 2-2. Yeah. Is there a flaw in any other stage? Ooh. Like, say, um, if somebody got three Fs at A-level or whatever. No, I think, I think if you got a 2-1 or a first, then we can see that you've demonstrated the academic ability. So we're not, it's not a sudden death application. Mm. We're not looking for the worst that you perform. We're looking for the spark that shows that you're good enough, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and also, the, re the bit of the form... <coughs> where you as an individual come alive are the boxes at the end, the really awful, difficult boxes where you have to talk about yourself. For me, they're the most exciting bit because I get to see you as an applicant. I mark loads of them every year. And the ones that say, well, I've got three points and point number one, generic, oh, it's, I find it very inspiring. Try and think about putting yourself on the page a bit more, something that maybe not other people, not a generic sort of homogenized taught thing, do something that makes you come alive on the page. What's important to you about being a barrister? Why is it that you think you're going to be good at this? And it might not be that you're really, really good at analysing law. I'm sure you are. But it might be that you're great at calming down a stressful situation. Or you're, people come to you because they trust you. There could be something about you in the broad range of skills that it takes to be a barrister that I go, ah, oh, we need this person. Mm. interview and also by the way this year we're trying to increase the number of people going through to first round interview because we think that's the best way of it mm. so that that we're opening that mm. up far more this year and we're doing two panels for our first round which i mean it's, a, it's an enormous saturday where all our barristers sit in from like eight o'clock in the morning till seven o'clock at night it's a really intense day but we're doing that for two sets of barristers mm. now to get as many of your people in the room as possible Again, I, I can't promise that we're perfect, but we are desperately trying to make it mm. as fair and open to everybody as possible. Thank you very much. Okay, question at the back. Hiya. Um, Hello. Right at the back. <laughs> um, I have a question about tattoos. Um, obviously, tattoos Interesting. Are very I had a case with tattoos in once, but oh. I'll come back to that. <laughs> I feel like they're quite, like 25, 30 years ago, having tattoos was seen as like, quite <coughs> non-traditional and frowned upon in law, but like, I'm not sure how it is now, because I've got tattoos on my arm, but I can cover them up. So, and obviously with piercings as well, I feel like it's seen as unprofessional. I'm not sure if that's changed or not. So You get all sorts of people at the bar. You know, I, I, I don't see it. I, I genuinely have never even turned my mind to the idea of a tattoo being a problem. If you've got tattoos, I think keep them if it's important to you. Well, I can't get them off now. Well, it, well there we go. I mean, you are quite committed. I mean, there we go. So, yeah, I don't... 
I mean, you might, at some of the extremely traditional sets, you might get someone who looks at you a funny way. <laughs> but quite frankly, do you want to be at one of those sets that's against people with tattoos? I mean, it's a sort of reverse question as well. Where do you want to be working? Like, certainly, it, I mean, I know some of my colleagues who have tattoos, so I, I think it's okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think it's changed. Yeah, I was just yeah. wondering, because I know traditionally, like, I was speaking to someone from City upstairs, and he said that he had a piercing in when he practised... They told him to take his piercing out, like near piercing. The only time when I've had people to being told to take piercings out is when our netball team go and play netball. <laughs> That's um, yeah. So, other than that, we never win. By the way, we're horrific. But you know, it's it's good. It's good to play sport. So. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. I don't right. think it wouldn't worry us particularly if they're just on your arms. I mean, you, you, if you if you're dressed professionally, they wouldn't show anyway, would they? Yeah. Um, piercings. Um, we, we, we actually have um, a dress code to, to help our pupils. It's not a, a, a prescriptive one. It's more a sort of what not to do. And uh, what we say about piercings is um, we don't mind ear piercings. We don't mind one small nose piercing. Um, anything uh, tongue piercing needs to go because you can't talk properly. Um, and uh, any, uh, eyebrow piercings, well, we'd rather you took it out, really, because they're very distracting. Um, but we don't have a, a specific thing against them. Uh, I think it's entirely up to, up to um, what, what people want to do. And of that's, course, that's important, yeah, the distraction yeah. point, absolutely. Um, and any piercing under your clothes, entirely up to you what you pierce. Yeah. Just, don't clank, <laughs> just, just don't clank too much. <laughs> the, the point about distracting is really, really important though, because for example, if you're the judge in court and yeah. you're listening to your submissions, do you want the judge to notice your bright fluorescent shirt or the quality of your submissions. Mm. It's the Coco Chanel point, yeah. wear a good dress and they notice mm. the woman, that mm. point rather than if you mm. wear a bad dress, they notice the dress. So have a think about how you want to present yourself that's going to make your points come across well uh, and then go with your personal style, I would suggest. But Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Loads of, this is yes. good, yep, yeah, yeah, that one. Um, and so this follows up on directly from that, so obviously... Are you pierced too? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm more from the more visible tattoos oh, yeah. that aren't so hideable. Um, so obviously I, I, I do have um, tattoos on my neck, I have yeah. tattoos on my head, I have tattoos on my hands and fingers. Um, I, um, what you were saying earlier on about the self-filtering thing, I, I was very close to self-filtering mm. because um, looking to invest loads of money and time mm. just with the view of I, I see how competitive pupillage is anyway, mm. and I've, I've got that hurdle to potentially overcome. Um, I was just going to ask, in, in both of your experiences, have you come across many barristers with visible tattoos? Yes. I mean, it's not everybody, mm. but I think as mm. well, tattoos are becoming a bigger thing too, now. Yeah. In people in the younger generations, I think it's becoming more... more vi like When I was in my you know, 20s, not many of my mates had tattoos. It just wasn't a thing, but it's increasingly important. It's quite culturally important mm. as well. So I don't think you'd be right to filter out no, people with tattoos because actually it's, you know, it's not just about a choice, it's also culture. So I, I, I don't think you should be concerned about the tattoos on your hand. Be proud of them. One of our clerks at Keating, he's, he's gone to 20 Essex now, he had the most amazing tattoos all over it. He'd regularly show us as well because he was very <laughs> trim. But he had, you know, and it's just the most amazing artwork. So I don't think no. you should come in. I mean, how, how do you know you're getting your pre-filtering right as well? You're thinking that someone's not going to accept you. <clears throat> Why don't you present your best application? And if they if they reject you because you're wearing tattoos again, mm. are they the right place for you? I mean, really, do you really want to join somewhere that's got those sort of 40 um, years ago viewpoints. But basically, make it their problem, not yours. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Be there. I'm awesome. And, um, he is I mean, not. Awesome. Yeah, but not. Yeah. Too, <laughs> you, you don't walk in saying you're awesome because that, that really would put yeah. everybody off. But, you know, you, you turn in, you're brilliant at everything else, and people go, well, you know, so what? Yeah. I don't know how judges would view it, but that would yeah. be something to. to um, I, I don't think even these days most judges would particularly be bothered, would they? Yeah, we've got an event next week yeah. um, at Keating. It's an online event. It's called Women at the Commercial yeah. Bar, but it's for every gender. Um, and we've got three judges coming, and I was just thinking about their viewpoints. And I think, I don't think they'd 
bat an eyelid <laughs> about tattoos. They really wouldn't. We, we, They're we've from got such a, mem- a range of backgrounds. Yeah, One's a lady mem- justice as well. We've got a member of Chambers with dreads. He runs in and out of Chambers. And nobody ever says yeah. anything. So Happily, we are getting to a position now yeah. where there's representation from all the... It's getting to the stage. We're not perfect, as I'm not... Mm-hmm. I don't think, but we're getting to the stage where it's all about your analysis, your judgment, your ability to Gentleman persuade. Here. Yes. Oh, another question. Yes, 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 yes. It sounds so much better now because before I was coming here, I was a bit concerned about my lush hair. And I was like, should I tie he, he it? He does have should lush I, hair, people. He does have lush hair. <laughs> should I tie it? What should I do? Do barristers look like it? So I came up with an argument. If somebody asked me, why do you have got long hair? I was just waiting for them to get white, you know, uh-huh. instead of wearing a wig. But now it's good to know yeah. that, you know, it's far become matter. so accepting. Mm. You know, I can be easy. The one thing I would say is in court, uh, irrespective of your gender, if you have long hair, it should look as neat and tidy as possible. I tend to tie it back, tie it back. because the yeah. judge can see your yeah. expression, your yeah. face and so on. It just makes the ability to get your points yeah. across much better. And if you're constantly looking down and then up at the judge, because you know, it's, it's just better mm. to get it out. So the way you've done it, for example, totally fine. Mm. But it's personal preference. Again, it's how do you affect your advocacy most brilliantly? And so... So in the commercial, do you guys still wear a wig, or is it just yeah, exclusive for I do sometimes. It, for us, it's um, you can right, if you want to. I think at the moment in the in the TCC, which is the main court mm-hmm. I'm in, you use business attire. But if you go to the course of appeal, then it's the full stuff. And I'm, I'm grateful that they keep that because it connects right. us with our history. Yeah. And I think it's brilliant. Um, if we chucked it all out, then it would just be really kind of, you know, like the city. Um, mm. So I'm glad we keep it. People mm. have different views on the wig thing, but I think it's cute. Right, um, anyway, so. yeah. I love my wig. Yeah. <laughs> I look at it and, and it just reminds me every time I see it that I did make it against yes. somebody else. Yeah. Yes, it's a badge of I, I got there. Mm. So, mm. yeah, be proud of all of that, I think. Yeah. And also, quite interestingly, and I think this does go back to, to what the, the worst, worst old days, and we're not totally through it yet, which is uh, John Roberts QC, who's one of the first black QCs in the country. Um, he, once, he loved his wig and gown, and he said to me, Cheryl, um, when I go into court in my wig and gown, everybody sees me as a barrister. Yes. And I think it does have that effect <laughs> when you're wearing it. Um, all the personal attributes, the hair, the, the tattoos, um, you know, the, the um, whatever else, that they, they, they fade into the background, you're a barrister. And, and it's a great feeling. Um, moment, first moment I walked through the RCJ wearing mm. my wig and gown and I swished my way across that magnificent room. Wow. I just thought, I'm never going to feel this good again. And I really haven't. It was just that wonderful moment. I thought, I made it. So, yeah. And you can too. That's, that's yes. the message you can too. Yes. We have a couple of minutes left. Do you mind if I you to the question, are there any support networks in place at the bar? Yes. Of course. Do you want to go first or should I? Um, yes, I, I, I'm... Um, there are a number out there. Your inn is the first place I would go to. Um, they have amazing mentor uh, programs. They have. Um, they will help you if you uh, have difficulties. Um, I also uh, ra- raise the flag for bridging the bar, because Aaron Mayers, who is a new tenant in, in my chambers, was um, one of the people who was instrumental really in setting up bridging the bar. Yeah. Bridging the bar was aimed mainly um, at barristers from ethnic minorities, <coughs> but it is not discriminatory. Um, you know, it will help anybody who satisfies the criteria uh, and it helps with um, mini pupillages and basically the, that sort of access to the bar that those of us coming from different backgrounds often don't get, which is um, the, the, the being comfortable in the environment bit. Uh, and it's really important. Mm. You know, the first time you walk into the inn and you say, oh my goodness. It's a bit grand. It's, it's very grand. And yeah. I didn't go to Oxford or Cambridge, I went to Lancaster. Um, and, and for me, it was like, wow. Um, people who've been to Oxford and Cambridge, well, it's a little bit like dining, dining in the college. Yeah, but I was called a northern monkey at Cambridge. Yeah. So, you know, I was, I was re- dealt with slightly separately. Yeah. But you just sort of got on with it, yeah. you know. But, or maybe I am a northern monkey. But um, it, so, so it helps you to sort of cross that bridge. So th- those, are the, those are the ones I would think of. And also, um, if you get pupillage, you're your um, chambers should always be available to you as well, mm. uh, sort of towards the end. But at the beginning, um, speak to your inns. Um, 
look at what's available at your university, look online, there's an enormous amount of stuff online which can help you. Um, and just get to know as much as you can about the environment, about the world that you want to get into, because the more you know about it, the more comfortable you're going to be and the more you're going to, as you walk in, go, I belong. Um, so there are support systems out there, and I'm not sure if you know of any, any of the others. They're all the primary the, ones, I yeah. think, but if you start thinking, actually, this area of law is really the one for me, then mm. there are law associations mm. that also do mentoring schemes and usually are free for students, mm. etc., to join. So a uh, com bar for the commercial bar, yeah. people who want to do that sort of thing, or there's a common law association. Yeah. Criminal bar if you really want to do construction, there's a tech bar group. Again, they'd welcome you with open arms. And they, I know that tech bar do a mentoring scheme and they do all sorts of stuff like application form type mm. assistance yeah. and so on. Really, really good stuff. We are saying that Atkins does that. So um, really, those are your next port of call if you start filtering it down to, I really want to do that area. But your university and your, uh, your in, great starting yes. points, great starting points. Um, I think we had another question, actually. Or have yes. we run out of time? Let's squeeze in that one last question, why not? <laughs> so um, with like, life of a barrister, um, I was just thinking about like, children. Like, do you have time to basically build a life? Really good question. <laughs> Crikey, for the last minute, that's an enormous Ooh. question. Um, can, maybe I can go first on yes, this one. Yes. I, I sort of did it slightly in reverse because I had my children when I came to the bar. Um, I think you have to have, if possible, a good support system in place. Uh, in all, you, you can do it, um, but adjustments have to be made. Um, you have to have a good support system. I was very fortunate. I had parents who were phenomenally supportive. Uh, and my ex-husband, although we didn't like each other, uh, was, was fantastic. I have to give him credit. It's gritting my teeth, but I have to give him credit um, mm -hmm. because he, he also um, did amazing things looking after the children. Um, you have to really, really organise. Um, and it, it, it is possible. Um, I think it's getting easier. I think particularly in the last two to three years... It's, it's quite recent. O over the last, over lockdown and things, I think a lot of people have had a lot of thoughts about what needs to happen. And I think chambers now are much more cooperative. Um, certainly we have a very good maternity policy, uh, well, in fact, parental policy, because it, it covers uh, both parents, um, which, which assists with um, suspending rental payments and um, uh, gradually reintroducing oneself uh, of course, what you can't do is get maternity pay because that just doesn't... It, you're you're self-employed. Um, and um, people have babies all the time in our chambers. I mean, particularly the last 20 months, it seems to have been every time I turn it on. Uh, somebody, somebody's had a child, which is great. Um, so, yeah, it, it is possible. It, it requires um, fairly ruthless management of time. And I, you also have to be prepared to give up maybe some other things like um, a social life for a while. Um, you, you can't do it all. No, don't ever tell anybody you can have it all, all the time, because you can't. You can have it all over a period of time, uh, sequentially. Yeah, I mean, I, I look forward to the day when having children is a people problem rather mm. than a women's problem, but mm. I don't think we're there yet. Um, so mm. there are in our set um, we have a we've reviewed our ma maternity it's now mm. a, a parents mm. um, policy but it's the women who usually use it mm. um, because the men don't really disappear from chambers because they've got a great wife at home that's unfortunately still and that's still for the younger people because that's just how society is still built but that's not a bar problem I think that's a society mm. problem mm. the good thing about the bar is you're in charge of your timetable unlike an employed person so you might choose to do the children drop-off pick-up. You might then work, get back for three o'clock, do the, the pick-up, and then start work again once the child's gone to sleep. Mm. That's what a lot of people yeah. do. And the mm. flexibility of that is incredible. You can also do a lot of work from home because you're working on your own effectively. Yes, there's teamwork required, but you can do it from a remote place. Mm. So there are real benefits. Yes, we don't have maternity play, pay, but we do have support in a similar way. There's a minimum that all sets have to do. Yeah. We've added to that Absolutely. because we think it's important. But go up there and ask the sets. Go and you know, challenge them. What's your, what's your maternity and paternity policy? 
Mm. Is we get asked that all the time because it's really important. This is your life, and you mm. know you're joining a group. What what do they? How do they care about their colleagues? To so ask. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Give a big round of applause.